the thing for the truth. Hello. Haley. We're just kind of waiting for people. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, great. Hi, Lee. Is Lee Schmidt available here as well? Okay. Hi, Lee. Good. I was just making sure. We're going to start in a couple minutes. I just put some nice salsa music to kind of get us going, get the mood going a little bit. Just keep on using the Zoom chat um, win. And so I see here on my left-hand side participants and so forth. So I'm assuming that Eric will be uh, allowing people in. But I do want questions, Lee, so uh, feel free to um, just hang on and we're going to start in a couple minutes. All right, well, it sounds like we're about to start. Eric, I'm assuming that you'll let people come in as they come in. And I'm just gonna log out of Facebook and stuff and just get us going. Um, and hopefully by closing this, doesn't close off everything. Oh, isn't that lovely? The music just stopped just stopped right there, right when we needed it. So I'm just gonna start my video. Hey y'all, hello. Sounds like this is recording. Oh, hi Kathy. People can join and view, and if you wanna be able to come in, I can let them in at your request. I'm watching the chat, this is how the webinar works. All right, how y'all doing? Happy Monday. Hey ladies, hi. Oh, and we got Catherine um, Stephens and Kathy and Lee and Miriam. Oh my gosh. Hi, ladies. Hello. Um, so I'm just going to start with um, sharing a little bit of my screens with you guys. I have been um, asked to do this. Um, this talk today will be about storytelling grounded in equity. 
Yeah, and I know I'm starting right at the top of at at 331, simply because I want to be respectful of people's time and get us out of here at a good time and get you with the tools that you you will need to continue your storytelling, either empire or the platform that you're developing, or maybe that you are spearheading other folks to come in um, into uh, sharing their stories on your platform. So I'm assuming that we have various different people on here. I know there are some people who are, who are leaders who are helping identify those stories and highlighting them and uplifting them. And then there are people here who might be wanting to start their own storytelling platform or how can they uplift the marginalized stories that they're hearing every day. So how do we relate this intersectionality? Oh, lots of intersectionality here, lots of pause into this um, subject of the coronavirus and what's happening right now to stories and storytellers. I myself um, have been storytelling, I think this is like pretty much how I learned English, was through watching and mimicking stories and how they um, evolved in my background was through my grandmother doing a lot of storytelling. So as an adult, I have found that I have a form of dyslexia. And through that, it's, it, made it made me understand why storytelling was, oral storytelling was so important for me. And having every um, pronunciation, every annotation, and every connotation of those words really flow um, to me and why they meant so much was because when I would try to read them, right, the words would mix up a little bit. So that being said, I became just almost obsessive about storytelling and wanting to hear stories from all over the world, um, really. And so I started listening to a lot of TED Talks. You know, I was um, enjoying um, doing writing circles around storytelling and prompts and so forth and learned so many um, ways to harness my own stories and write them with patience, without the anxiety of like a teacher standing over me, without the time, um, time anxiety of maybe some sort of writing a paper of some sort. And through that um, almost subconscious writing, uh, the art of storytelling came to me and I just, as now, um, that happened about like around 15 years ago. And so since then I've been helping nonprofits because that's where I started working was in nonprofit work, um, providing uh, social services uh, through Joining Forces for Families, which is still a very viable and uh, worthy uh, network of social services in Dane County. And nowadays though, even to get acknowledgement or not even acknowledgement just like to get community capital buy-in for your programs you need to be really well versed in how to raise equity through storytelling right through the very people that you want to impact you got to know how to um, cultivate those relationships and so we're going to go through some of those steps today and it says here that I am now streaming live through Facebook. So, hey, Facebook people. Um, I will be able to switch back and forth through apps. I'm just not going to be able to do that. So there will be some questions um, through this work, um, through this workshop today. And um, perhaps later on, I can go into the stream and Facebook and they'll be able to answer your questions. Okay. But as of right now, oh, I'll be watching the Facebook and the chat says Eric. So if I, if you hear me saying words to you guys and you're like, where is she seeing that? That's all in the Zoom uh, web chat. And so Eric's kind of, um, Eric of church is, uh, is kind of our moderator for today. So I wanted to bring with you guys what I'm bringing in, what I'm bringing with me today on this talk. And these are these two books. One is called Sustaining Spirit, and it's by Noemi Ortiz, and she's doing self-care for social justice. So a lot of the agencies that I work with are grounded in social justice and racial justice. And another person is Aurora Levens Morales, and it's called Medicine Stories. So I know it's like flipped right at the screen, uh, but we can put these later on in the chats for you guys. Um, in the in Facebook invite, you would have seen a couple of links. One was a YouTube video of the dangers of a single story. Okay, so we'll maybe re review that. I have the three minute um, one that's, I have it right on here um, for screen share. And then also an article, which was um, the pitfalls of nonprofits when they are tokenizing uh, marginalized communities or people of color. And so through those articles and all of this work is how we're gonna um, 
uncover some things that you can take into your toolbox on how to build equity uh, for your audience and for your platform, for your agency, for the, for the groups that you want to support, for the women that you love, for the men that you love, for the children that you love, for the storytellers that you love, um, you know, whatever you're feeling most dedicated to. And, and when I say love, I do also mean like dedication. It's not just like um, passion. So passion, we throw that word around. I'm very wordy, as I said earlier, you know, I'm really into the connotations and descriptions of words. And so when I hear that so often, it becomes very empty. Uh, the word uh, uh, passion, right? I'm passionate for this. But really, what does that mean? And I think we did deeper it means what am i dedicated to and so how you're going to use this i hope is in a way to give you um, more speed in your dedication and just uh, more righteousness in what you decide to do so my first challenge question for you audience is what is equity and what does it mean for you and i'm just going to give people some time to go through that and while we're doing that i'm going to do a little screen share as well And so while you guys are thinking about what equity means to you, I wanted to put down my own profile of benefits of workshops that I do in my consultant work and how I build trust through confidence and wellness offerings such as this course. And how I do that is through, um, is through introduction, some writing, some peer sharing, and sharing in groups. And then we close with some relaxation techniques that I've learned through either Breathe for Change or my Shambhala training as well. Of course, I have my teacher on this, on this line, Miriam. She's amazing. She's there with us. Hi, Miriam. <laughs> and so I'm waiting for to hear some more uh, from you guys to see. And this is like... You know, this is, we're all kind of doing this together. So it's going to see if I have any, anything in the Q&A. Oh, no open questions. How do I open a question here? Oh, let's just go back into the chat. All right. So yeah, let me know what you think. For the, those of us who are on Zoom, let me know what you think is equity for you. And I'm kind of just, um, I'm just watching here see who's all on the chat right now and if you can just put in one sentence there of what equity means to you and I'll check back into the chat in a little bit in the meantime I'm gonna go back over here to this article um, and it's in the links and I'll and I'll actually put that guy right away into our chat as well so that you guys can access it at the same time oops i really love this article it comes from helen kim ho and you can find her in medium medium has become a really powerful tool to be able to um can you give an example said polly ah yes i can i'm going to give an example of yes of building equity one way I think that is really important to build equity is by like what I just did, which is naming the author right away, naming the medium, how it was. Another example that I just, I mean, even recently, almost every day, right, we are sharing things, images from, say, Instagram. And then you kind of screenshot it, you know, post it back onto your page. But if you're not tagging the agency, the influencer, or whoever. And right now I see that a lot on um, marginalized communities. You know, we're great for or original content. We're amazing artists and we have a, a really keen eye on, on what's happening right now, especially um, when it comes to COVID-19, right? We have marginalized communities that are suffering every American community right now in, Dane, in Wisconsin is suffering. They're dying at a higher rate than anyone else in the country. And so when that information is being shared, who are we crediting that article to? Are we crediting it back to who wrote it or back to the communities perhaps that are helping with the situation? So it's like framing it all. And it's a lot of labor. Mind you, I'm on, I'm on the internet right, right there with you. And so I know that's a lot of labor to do to investigate it. 
But if we're going to properly um, show that equity, we got to put in almost as much as labor as the stories that they impact and the stories that are the originators, right? And so that's how you're going to be paying it forward and giving people um, the right information. You'll get corrected perhaps too. I mean, it might not be exactly um, the, the exact information. The information changes day by day. And so just being gentle with yourself as well too and just acknowledging that you might not have all the answers is really appropriate. And so this article was written in 2017. I do feel that this article is still very legitimate today. Um, a lot of content that contains people of color is just plain eye-catching. Why? Because in our in the United States, we are exposed to mostly a white media, right? So there's a there's always going to, there's more majority of white people in it. So then, therefore, when you're online and you see content with a person of color, it's very eye catching, right? You're just you zoom in on it. You're going to look at more of the actions and reactions of what that um, content or image is saying to you as well. Um, and she goes through a lot of different tips. But one way I thought was really interesting as far as equity and giving that example is like you pay the staff in charge of messaging are white. So a lot of our communicators, a lot of the people who share are paid staff. And at a level that's like very elevated to your volunteer storytellers who are people of color. And so that's also, it's, it perpetuates the economic um, inequality against people of color, but it also strips the people of color ownership of their own stories. And so we went back to like COVID-19, what's happening right now with African Americans in um, the state of Wisconsin that are dying at a more higher rate than um, our white counterparts are. And the narrative has been, it's because of the lifestyle and so forth without including the health inequities that were there prior to, because we had um, black, African, um, black infant mortality rates were quite high previously um, to this. And so, um, Polly has a question asking for example, yes, I, and I'm addressing that question as far as like, how, what's an example of building that equity is going to be um, by, is going to be by actually supporting um, people of color storytellers and um, basically here recruiting people of color to support the organization that doesn't value or pay them is the ultimate, is the ultimate tokenizing. So what can you do and that's kind of my question to you all it's, is like how can you help um equalize this one way is i think is by giving credit another way is through stipend and through economics i think we're going to start finding that there's going to be more ways throughout this conversation and so keep on that list oh so you know what i thought about this this is a way i can do it maybe it's not money maybe it's something else which is grounded in social capital and what's social capital? But word of mouth, right? Word of mouth is gonna be our biggest um, equalizer, I think, too, in, in, this, in our toolkit for today. So another thing is what is social capital? Well, social capital is about telling your neighbor about that delicious pizza that you had, about that delicious food you had. Um, it's about talking about the weather. It's about, um, you know, door-to-door -door volunteers explaining a candidate's platform. Oh, that's social capital too. Wow. So there's a lot there, right? I mean, number three right here, and this is just something from Google, from Oxford that I just came up with. I was like, I knew how I could describe it to you guys. And it's funny because my description of social capital was actually coming from um, the race, a race class and gender lens, a critical race class and gender lens, where we talk about asset building. So in larger society, or when you're looking through this um, lens, oftentimes single parent households or multi-generational households are not seen as an asset, when really we are, because you have the asset of being able to talk to various different relationships, you would adaptability in so many different systems, both welfare, economics, and so forth. But when we're talking about that type of capital, those type of assets with social capital, it quadruples, it really does. It quadruples uh, the level of impact that you can have. So if you're gonna talk about, say, a candidate, a candidate of color, somebody that is um, somebody, of, a woman of color even, or somebody who's a woman of color who's disabled even, and if you're talking about them as, as a candidate, can you imagine the social capital that you can give them and, and you know, forward, pay it forward to them and to their platform? 
So it's all here. It's all, like, it's all the internet. I didn't really have to put, you know, I don't, I put my spin on it. It's a, a, to introduce you guys into the, into this. But is it, is there any other questions? Let's take a little break here. I think we're still, um, Polly, let me know if you feel like that I've answered your question um, specifically as far as like an example to equity. Thank you, Kathy. Every, Kathy says to everyone, everyone gets what they need or rather everyone gets the same amount. Also, solutions are designed to first meet the needs of the most vulnerable. Yeah, that solutions, the solutions that we think of first are, and how do we do that, Kathy? How do we do that? If we, you know, how do we do that truly? And Lee says, everyone having access to what they need, not necessarily everyone getting the same thing. That's true, very true. Colleen said, everyone is getting what they need when they need it and how they need it. That is so important, how they need it. In the Facebook rule, um, in the Facebook invite, I had put down um, best practices um, and I can share that with you guys as well um, here. I put you guys like best practices and I got it from poets.org because yes, I am a poet and I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> that this is a great <laughs> this is a great website to look at right now for me it was maybe because it's it's uh, put in a way that um, I'm going to share this to all of us here to all of our panelists or all of the hosts here and attendees um, this link and it's basically how to do captioning so I really love that you said that Lee as far uh, as far as um, like how to do it that is so important. How we tell these stories and how we replicate their stories is important too. So most of the time on social media is like a picture, maybe a video or something. But again, I was talking about the framing. How do we um, add more to this? Maybe the platform is too limited. Maybe I need medium. Maybe it would be better if I had um, if I had an account on medium and I did it that way. Maybe it's through a blog post, something of that sort. And the only reason why is because that's going to give you more agency, more space, more tools to be able to do some of that other uplifting and the how, right? The captioning that maybe you might need. You might need someone to do sign language there. You know, I did not ask any of my participants right now whether or not they needed this in an, in an alternate, alternate format. And that's something that I think as we move forward in this way of communicating that we're gonna to have to be very conscious of. We always think, I mean, at least for me, I think about language. I was pretty assured by the people who registered that I wasn't going to, um, that I didn't need bilingual services, but, or for me to be bilingual at the same time. That's a huge thing to expect of, an, of a presenter is to do it in dual, in dual languages. So, and that's something that I get asked a, a lot is for me to do some sign, simultaneous uh, translations in my presentations. And I won't do that. Maybe I might do that for, like for friends um, or in my own Facebook group. I might do that, but I won't do that necessarily in a presentation. It just takes a long time. And it's, uh, it's an un, it's, it's a skill that really should be taken with thought, right? Um, it can't, translations on the fly tend to be not as impactful. Um, they tend to be conversational and not as educational. Um, they need to be done with thought and process. And so if it was all narrated out, I could possibly do it um, by captioning and I would do it afterwards in the editing and then reboot the video. And so that's a way of a workaround through that. And that's something that you might want to think of when you're, um, if you're in charge of any kind of like trainings for your organization or trainings that you want to host and you would like it to be translated in another language. I mean, thinking about recording it now and then going back to in editing it for closed captioning or for translation. And that's something you want to think about in the, in the front end of your project. I'm looking down here because I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> uh, I won't lie. Uh, so we are here at now 350. So we've been, I've been talking for a good 20 minutes and I wanna make sure that you have what you, 
what else do you hope to like learn, copy, steal, <laughs> whatever it is? What other things would you like to, um, if you had one more question to ask me back, you know, right now, real quick, what other things would you like me to dig into? Catherine, Colleen, Kathy, Lee, and Miriam, and Polly. So I'll let you guys just like kind of mule over that. And I'm gonna screen share again. Um, So as I'm getting those, I'm gonna like put these up on this little uh, white board. And I don't know if you guys have access to this whiteboard. I'm what if it was really that um, interactive, that'd be kind of cool if you guys were able to like write on here too. <laughs> but if not, I'm just gonna um, go on to another screen that I had set up for y'all. Oh, okay. Eric was saying I can bring others on if you'd like. I don't think they do. Oh, okay. So we're kind of seeing that that might not be a possibility. All right, I'm gonna screen share this article again. I think this article is really, really good. I mean, it goes through a lot of, <laughs> this meme, I love it. Um, it goes through a lot of like, you can create and maintain organizational culture that promotes white dominance. How do you do that, you know? And I don't think it's just like organizational culture. I think it's movement culture too. Movement culture right now is, um, is being very, hmm, it's being very much like this, yes. <laughs> it's just like, it's being aggressive, but also passive aggressive at the same time. And so it's hard to sift through that and making sure that you, you're, not in, you're not tokenizing the very people that you wanna help. And I think it's just being gentle with yourself and allowing, um, allowing and choosing like certain people to kind of like check you on certain times when you're sharing or when you're promoting or when you're highlighting a story. And some things, one thing I know I promised you guys was how to learn how to navigate and lead your own Facebook group. I'm not going to go into your desktop is being paused. Oh, okay. Stop the share. As a white woman who helps people tell stories, how do I get out of the way while still holding space? Oh, Miriam, I love that. How do you get out of the way by holding space? And I think that is so important. I think that this, the strategies that you utilize in your classroom and your classes um, are very helpful. Free writing um, so, you know, is really helpful. Prompting is really helpful. I think, um, by getting out of the way, I think that you're you're saying, I don't want it to come from me to the people. I want it to come from the person that I'm really enjoying to those to my audience. And how do I present them that? Yeah, right, exactly. And by taking yourself out of that middle person, I think what um, I think what you're doing is really great. And I've seen your newsletters myself um, for people that do it. <laughs> Miriam teaches um, Shambhala writing classes in the community using a lot of meditation and reflective thoughts and so forth. I'm not going to go really into all of what she does, but what's amazing is like newsletter writing. I think it's what, what she's doing is even positioning the people of color in her newsletter on top. And by giving them that space there, that's important. I think that's important. I'm not reading the whole thing and then having her say it at the bottom where she's like, oh, by the way, please follow XYZ person because I think they're amazing. No, she's putting them on top. She's giving you hyperlinks already. She's encouraging, you know, posting, taking the time to like copy and paste the date, right? Because then we, we need to have those dates sometimes, right? Because we forget. Um, I think that's important too, is where you position them in your, in, in it. When you're still holding space for them, Getting out of the way, I think, is going to be where we're just reflecting some of their own content. Perhaps it is giving, making sure that that content was given with permission. So if it takes you, Marion, to go back to say, like, Sonia Renee Taylor, going back to her and asking her, hey, can I copy this part from you? 
So that's going to even build your relationship with that influencer even more because we all love that compliment and that just broadens and deepens your relationship with them. And then I think that's going to give you an opportunity to know how to support them best too, because that's going to put them on the radar. Hey, Miriam is helping me out with content. I want to know more about what she's doing. How can we both grow? And that's my, and that's the one thing I would hope that you guys take out of this conversation is my own little mantra that I've come up with. Uh, again, one of those disparaging words, little, right? Okay, it's a big mantra. I was there with Eric. Eric, you were there with me. Um, at Breathe for Change, we went through this uh, program about a year and a half ago. And it was really intense program. It was SEI, which is social emotional learning. We did centric circles. It was a lot of crying. It was a lot of like, whoa, I'm looking at you. It's like one of those retreats where you stare at people, you cry, and you're like, oh man, this is my story, this is my heart. And in that time period, I came up with this mantra of there's, you know, one thing I didn't like when I was like in my 20s and my 30s was everybody's like, oh, the kitchen's too hot, you better get out kind of like oh you're too young you're too this you're too little yet you don't have value enough to be in the kitchen with all of us like we got enough cooks or you've heard that expression right there's too many cooks in the kitchen um the kitchen's too hot I do every I mean everything I've ever learned has been in the kitchen has been in the kitchen with these amazing Mexicanas making these amazing tamales or tortillas and whatever and we're talking about all kinds of life and you cannot imagine like how much life can go into cooking right but we all know this that it's like hard cooking is hard being in the kitchen is hard those are hard stories so when we kind of this uh, European way of thinking like there's too many there's only enough for us there's only enough cooks for us or you have to be legitimized as a cook to be even in the so we could go with that metaphor for a long time but my point is is that my mantra was like the kitchen's big enough and we all can learn to cook and we kind of all are cooks we're all cooks we can learn to cook so that's kind of my mantra from all of that time period of spending with breathe for change which is an amazing program i hope that you guys get, get to check it out they're doing a um, they're teaching SEI um, to various teachers um, in the United States. And so one of my other tips of being um, authentic is how not to harm in storytelling in regards to marginalized communities. And I want to read you guys this, um, this passage. From, it's called Forked Tongues. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Forked Tongues. Okay. So it's called Speaking in Tongues, and it's from the Medicine Stories. And this woman, Aurora Le uh, Levens Morales, she's like a Jewish, uh, Puerto Rican woman. She has, you know, she has been, she's a big philosopher and so forth in Chicana studies. So about five years ago, she says, I was tinkering with an editor, a feminist academic, about the changes she wanted to make in an article of mine when she informed me that a line I had written was not English. She didn't mean that it was in Spanish or Swahili and would I please translate. She meant the way I danced through syntax made her uneasy. That grammar wasn't stacking up the way she liked it. She was reminding me that she had a certificate of legitimacy and I didn't. Sure, it's English, I replied. It's just not your English. Then she says, not, no, really, she insisted, it's not good English. Good English, as I understand it, is a set of agreements about which words make sense, what they mean and in, in what order they need to be used in order to keep making sense. It's an attempt to make sure that we understand each other. It's a reasonable goal, but the group that makes these agreements, sets them down in rule books, is a tiny fraction of the multitudes of people who successfully communicate in the English language each and every day. Wow, that's a lot. When I was reading this passage the other night, I thought of you all, of the people that would be with me today. And I thought, there's so many times that we, um, as communicators, as those, um, when you were talking about how do you get out of the way, it's like, don't add it. Add it for maybe, you know, if it's a misspelled word, obviously, right? But don't add it if they're using like the would be 
or the they or the third person and then they go into say like let's not go there with the storyteller's story let's just take it for how it is their syntax is going to be very different than what you're used to um they're going to use words that are not going to be familiar to you and the metaphors and the deep meanings and you can ask for clarity obviously but it, like take like taking something that's saying your english it's like king's english right and so I think that I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, it's here in Medicine Stories. History, Culture, and the Politics of Integrity by Aurora Levens Morales. She's an amazing author. And with her, I also um, wanted to give you guys this tip about being authentic and not doing harm in storytelling in regards to marginalized communities. And how to be the savior, but that how not to be the savior but the invisible host which is what i think miriam was talking about as well and what we're all here for is how we can not be that savior but that invisible host and fortunately for we saw the extremes what happened with aurora in her writing even in academia writing her syntax wasn't um considered legitimate it wasn't considered forthright or needed and it was like no that's just not good english so thinking about what makes a good story it might not be a good story um for this particular campaign or this particular class or so forth but it's still a good story and how do you want to share that is really going to be important um what kind of coaching can you give are you willing to give that and thinking about that time commitment and those time commitments, they mean something. And so the more you open yourself up to that, how are you gonna deal with, how are you going to navigate those spaces? I think it's just to start really, you know, start small, start really small. I think that's how we can make the best impact and sort of like trying to like um, highlight so many different communities. Think about it. If you wanna just highlight maybe a social justice communities that are in North Carolina <laughs> or that are in the Appalachians and that are helping uh, the transition from like oil to like solar, solar energy. And if that's all you're gonna ever do, please do that, just that. But then think about the people who are originally in Appalachia. Think about the, uh, the people who migrated there. Think about the, the landscape of the Appalachia. Think about all those different things because it's as simple as you think it is. It has tons of intersectionality and there's tons of other ways to not be the savior, but be the invisible host. And that is how um, we're gonna discuss now a little bit of the dangers of the single story. Does, I want to do a little pit stop though. It's 4.03 now. We've been talking for a half hour. Any questions? Okay, Polly, I did not see your question. When I'm dealing with an international group of people in emails or social media, what are some tips for inclusivity? I think that when you're dealing, is there a way that you could possibly have them in groups according to their country? Or do you have to by force email all of them? And is that because of the way your MailChimp is? I'm asking those technical questions in the back end for you, um, just to get a deeper meaning on that. We'll come back to that question. I really do like that question. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way we can actually group some of those questions um, via the different groups that are already there. So if I had a large number of Latinos and then I don't always know what country they're in. Okay, okay, that's fair, that's fair. You know, I would definitely think of like things that are topics that are inclusive that are inclusive and that are engaging. You know, every, um, you know, recipes are really good. They're also really transcendent. Things that transcend culture that we're, that are human, that we are all dealing with, are, is, is a nice way to like open up the conversation, right? And, and doing a lot of that sharing, you know, and also engaging them to, to share back with you. Like you can, um, I know for one um, campaign I was, it was all like these, um, they, were, they were all part of this email campaign newsletter and they happened to be agencies around town that dealt with the environment. 
So I put myself down as the novice environmentalist person that had no idea about uh, recycling or the planet or anything. So every day, every week when I shared out a thing, I said, okay, this is what I learned this week about the planet. So I would force myself and Google like a planet fact <laughs> and then I would put it in the newsletter. And so although all of them came from different agencies, that the one thread that was around it was sustainability and in environmentalism so if we can find that one thread that can kind of like link everyone i think that would be great i hope that answers your question polly does anybody else have any other questions I love this like Q&A little thing. It's just like, yes, I have some ideas now. Thank you, Polly. Okay, so I'm just gonna play through this. Wait, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 no. This might not be the right YouTube. Sorry, guys. Here it is. Here she is. Let me know if you can hear it. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and uh, old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> I know. She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way. No possibility of feelings more complex than pity. No possibility of a connection as human equals. So that is how to create a single story. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is Nkali. It's a noun that loosely translates to, to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of Nkali. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Mouri Baguti writes that if you want to dispossess a people, mm -hmm. the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. Start the story 
with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British. Exactly. And you have an entirely different story. Start the story with the failure of the African state and not with the colonial creation of the African state. And you have an entirely different story. Oh my gosh, that's exactly what we were just talking about. I love this video. It never gets that old to, for me. I don't know about you guys, but it really, oh my gosh. Okay, wait, wait, I gotta pause this. Okay, stop the share. Um, I just love this, guys. She just said it right there. She said exactly kind of what I was saying, like where we start with this, narr with, with this uh, conversation especially right now around African Americans getting the most dying for COVID-19. Where are we starting with that conversation? I see so many people starting with like, no, because they're outside, not because of this and that, or their lifestyle, this and then. No, it's because it started with mistrust from freaking 100, 500, 1,000 years ago when you start, when experiments were done on African American people. Like a lot, for, you know, when the, those medical experiments were being done. I mean, who's gonna trust? It's hard, and they were not the only ones. You know, Latinas, Puerto Ricans have been experiment on right now. It's almost, it seems like we're, we're all being, ex um, ex Latinos are being experimented on by keeping us in cages. So there's a lot there, you know, there's a lot there. And this final question I have for you, um, well, two questions actually. How can you tie your agency or project's mission to the pandemic that is happening now? And what are some creative ways that I can help you do that, okay? But how can you tie your agency, your project, your dedication, what, what you're into right now, how can you tie that mission, you know, the vision, what you're doing, so say if it's social justice or if it's um, social justice um, in, dis in communities with disabilities, whatever that agency or movement it is, how can that mission be tied to the pandemic that's happening now? And that's a challenge I think we're all facing. Um, but I wanted to put it out there and see how I can help you perhaps brainstorm, um, you know, come up with some ideas on the fly here. And I'm just going to wait for questions to pop up again in this like beautiful question and answer area. But I, I just truly love it. And I'm so glad that I was able to find just that three minute cut clip. It's like three minutes and 40 seconds. And it gets right to the nugget of like, if we started our stories, when we start the stories of a people, it matters so much, right? It matters so much. If we're only going to give people the Frida Kahlo and the tacos, you're not going to know about the Latino experience in the country. You're just going to know that we brought in Frida Kahlo and tacos. Oh, great. But what if we started that story um, from Christopher Columbus, from before the time Christopher Columbus came? What if we started that story with um you know the tarasqueños becoming the first um male ponies <laughs> before there was ponies in mexico or donkeys doing it the the tarasqueños were running the mail system up and down the hills of michoacan and they were probably the first uh, postal service ever there ever was and they and they have extreme uh, speed and agility um in their running stance and we don't know that and right now she's there's a marathon woman uh latina mexicana uh, indigenous woman que is you know she runs pretty much like on sandals and, and she's won many marathons she's quite famous on uh, on uh, youtube and internationally has been asked and that's just the way she survives her family survives is making money through her runs so it goes from like way back when to now and how that intersectionality happens and how that storytelling happens is really dependent on how we frame it and where we start right so i'm just gonna wait for some more questions oh i got two questions on the q and a ah, okay i'm trying to <laughs> i'm just trying to I think it's an opportunity to share voices that are not being heard with their permission, of course, in an unedited manner. Yeah. Yeah. Miriam says, that was a great clip. I love that talk. Here's my question. I am feeling a bit overwhelmed with the work I already have. So the only thing I want to do to the pandemic, oh, right, is gently. Is that a question? Um, is that enough? <laughs> the question is whether that's enough. I think it is. I think it's definitely enough. Like, again, I. I think about going small and 
going small and steady right now is really what's going to be helpful um, for the communities that you want to impact and for the communities you want to engage in and highlight in your platforms already i think is going to be important just to reach out to the originator and don't do it all the time but once in a while that you're I mean, what i'm trying to say is it's not a responsibility for you every day to highlight a marginalized community in a story with the responsibility of you is for when you do do it to do it right right and that's that's the important thing if it's a weekly thing it's a bi-weekly thing if it's a monthly thing fine but do that right by going back to the originator perhaps and asking a question or two and i think that's going to alleviate the alleviate the need of think of putting yourself on a timeline and having it to do on a weekly or bi-weekly basis but as long as you're doing it correctly and like the most holistic way that's great and i will take away some of that overwhelming feeling i think too of like the expectation of every five seconds what is good to share for you thinking of um you know just proposing it back what is that reflection and what is it I mean, you're seeing all this information on Facebook and on social media, but what does it mean for you to see all that? What does it need you to be doing in, in this work? And that's my last question for you um, today. And making sure that I'm writing this right. What does it need you to be doing? I'm just writing this down here in, the, in this like little part here, need you to be doing. So it's a two part. It's like finding yourself in the landscape of the work you do, right? Thinking about that landscape. So I'm asking you to do some mindfulness right now, getting that mindfulness hat. If you need to close your eyes, that's great. You just want to imagine the landscape of the work that you do and why this landscape, okay? So you're thinking of it. Maybe it's Madison, maybe it's Oklahoma, <laughs> maybe it's in my case, sometimes it's Mexico, right? What does it look like, this landscape? Is it the art centers? Is it the museums? Is it the daycare centers? Is it the adult um, senior centers? What are these groups look like? All right. Think of their structures. Think of their buildings or logos, maybe. This landscape and why this landscape of your spaces, groups, and movements need you to be doing. What do they need you to be doing as far as work? So finding yourself in that landscape and identifying what that is, what those landscapes look like, what are their, um, their stakeholders, who are the, you know, there's different maybe levels, maybe there's little mountains and rivers and so forth, and like maybe there's parks in there too, and like what do those landscapes look like visually, like thinking about what that playground looks like where you play every day. Because you're there, you're there, you're being full of media all day, you're, searching and you're looking at all this media but it all has a thread right it all has some sort of commonality it's either self-empowerment it's either um, liberation it's social justice um, it could be writing it could be um building my own platform it could be a lot of different things but what does that landscape look and why the why does this landscape of your group spaces world need you to be doing like what does it need you to be doing not why oh, sorry guys Still kind of learning how to do this technology. I'm going to rewrite it again. And I'll leave you with this last question. It has a lot to do with the work that I've been doing with Aurora Levins Morales and the studies that I've been doing. She talks a lot about locating yourself in that landscape and uncovering your what and your why. Why does this landscape need you? Need you. I'm just gonna I'm just um, writing it down over here a little bit want to and subscribe to Okay, I'm putting this in the chat. I'm gonna re I'm restructuring it right here, guys. This is like editing live, right? <laughs> so if we think about our landscape, what is the why do these things need to be doing the work? And what I'm trying to get to is to your why. Like why are you still there? 
why are you still there in your landscape? And I think that's going to really help too with that overwhelming feeling of like, ah, it's too much. It's burning. It's dying. Like there's a pandemic happening. All those things are true. All those things are true. All of those things are true. There is a pandemic happening. There are people that are suffering right now and it's real. It's very real. I am not going to make too, too, I'm not going to make, make that a pretty note, but it, it's real. And in that reality, it's like, how are you going to find yourself in that landscape? Why are you still there? Oh, thank you, Polly. Polly says, you're right about the internal landscape. Never thought of that. Amazing. It asks for us. There's definitely an internal landscape that we are diving in every day and we visually are attracted to like certain messages on social uh gosh instagram oh, who hasn't been down those holes right <laughs> you know uh, youtube <laughs> i mean hello people are doing mukdang i just learned what mukdang is there's a mukdang um there's two people <laughs> that i follow here in madison that eat mukdang they did before the coronavirus they haven't been on it lately but they would get their food from like literally chicago like they reminded me so much of mexicanos like we are so the same in so many ways that way they're like we will travel to get the good food these guys would travel and eat these awesome potato chips from chicago like and this other stuff anyways it was so much fun because i would like travel with them with their eating using these mukdang videos i didn't know what that was but that's the glory about social media is that we get to go through all everybody else's, um, you know, their worlds, right? They let us into their worlds and we are an awesome audience because we show that empathy and that sympathy to them. So like, how do we repay that for that content, right? It's either through payment, it's either through representation and so forth. But why are we there? So maybe if we got to the why are we there, we can tell our friends, hey, this is why I was there. This is why you need to be there. Ah, that was kind of the thing. <laughs> that was like my conclusion. <laughs> so I, I ended up about eight minutes before. Um, it is um, 4.23 now. And that was the conclusion. Ah, sparkles. <laughs> that was it, guys. Um, that's the conclusion of today's class. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Gracias a ti, Miriam, for being here. And Kathy and Lee and Polly and Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Um, if you didn't hear it all, go back. Um, oh, for sure. She says she really loved, enjoy this and love you. Love you guys too. If you didn't catch it all, catch it back in there. Um, I will definitely, um, you know, most of you guys know me through Facebook. So if you want to, um, you know, message me and we can like have a little power later, um, do maybe like a zoom, like, I don't know, <laughs> we'll do a zoom drink or something later, but, um, whew. This is, here I was thinking, I don't think I can talk for an hour and telling you my favorite ways of uplifting equity and, and storytelling. Believe me, I'm telling you this from a very humble situation where I too have not done the best job. Okay, so I'm just telling you guys, do not be that hard on yourselves. There's always room for improvement and just keep on remem remembering why you're in it. Okay, all right, bye-bye, see y'all. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.